Welcome everyone to the final uh, module of our class. Well, I mean, unless you count exam three as a module that that it that does have its own module, but this is the last content module, um, and it's the also the last kind of um, third of the course. I mean, they haven't always been proportionally split up, but the the class is separated by these three exams, and now we're we're on to the last one here, uh, the informal fallacies. It's a nice little. Um, easy kind of letdown after a difficult quarter. Um, the last two exams have been very, very difficult, but um, this material is really going to culminate in an exam that is just a matching exam. Exam number three is not going to be super scary. It's not going to have you um, explaining uh, your thought process at all. I'm actually just going to, it's just going to be a matching thing. That's it. Um, but I like to start on this because I, I like to um, let you know like what's going to be happening and why we're what to be kind of thinking about as we're learning the material and even though I'm only going to be um, asking you to do this kind of matching exam to be responsible for this material there are plenty of tricky things to be on the lookout for uh, and I'm going to give you some tips about that here before we start talking about the actual content because um, it'll frame everything that we're going to do um, moving into the material. This section of the class is on the informal fallacies and I love I love teaching this. The informal fallacies are and if, if I was going to give a definition of them I might say the informal fallacies are just um, argumentative mistakes that are either so common and pernicious or nasty that we um, uh, or um, manipulative or um, where we're easily duped into them or very tempting sort of mistakes um, they're so much so that way that we wanted to put them on our radar by naming them and and identifying the pattern that's the bad reasoning or the bad argumentative practice um, so that we can keep track of it and try to recognize it when people are using these uh, bad argumentative practices in conversation with us so we're not duped by them um, but also as something to kind of uh, watch ourselves to make sure that we are not um, uh, getting tempted into using these ways of arguing as well. So they're really argumentative mistakes, but I mean there's so many different types of them. That, and um, they're called the informal fallacies because they um, these are argumentative mistakes that go beyond just the rules of logic like we got from uh, chapter 6 with like um, uh, arguments that are invalid, right? Um, or even the kinds of um, formal evaluations of inductive arguments, you know, the kind of principles that we were using um, to evaluate arguments of a certain inductive type, like argument from analogy or inference of S explanation or statistical generalization, stuff like that. Those, even though we had to make some more difficult judgment calls about them, they're still formal in the sense that those are criteria that attach to the, the form and type of argument that's taking place. These informal fallacies can sometimes just be, um, you know, not, not linked with any particular uh, style of reasoning, um, but they can show up all over the place and they're, and they're still, they're bad, they're bad ways to argue. There, I think you're going to find there's kind of uh, two different types of fallacy. Some of them, um, this kind of goes back to when we were talking about guarding, discounting, and um, assuring back with chapter three, uh, chapter three and four, um, where I described the kind of good, the bad, and the ugly. There's like maybe a right way to use a certain type of arguing, then there's a bad way, and then there's an ugly way. Well, the fallacies kind of fit into the bad and ugly categories, because they're definitely not the right thing to do. These are, we're trying to pick out the, the patterns that we should avoid, right? But some of them are bad in the sense that they don't help us with truth seeking they're like bad reasoning like a mistake kind of like uh, what we've mentioned I mentioned gamblers fallacy before in these lectures would be something like that kind of innocent you know it's like we just think wrong about probability or if we make a mistake when how we think about conditionals I was describing that when we were doing logic before and they're so they're they're bad they're mistakes we want to keep an eye out for them we want to avoid falling into those uh, logical traps but it's different from these ugly kinds of um, practices or abusive practices, like ways in which we argue with each other that not only doesn't help us get to the truth, but um, also is going to maybe run afoul of like the ethical requirement on the code of intellectual conduct. So things like ad hominem, that's going to be one of the fallacies on our list. 
um, attacking people instead of addressing their ideas. Uh, that's a good example of a fallacy that kind of does a bad job with both. It's like if you're attacking a person instead of their ideas, then we still don't know how to evaluate the ideas. And that's what we're really here to do when we're having an, a, a debate, a truth seeking debate. But also, you're hurting, you're just abusing the person. Um, that's not justified either. So there's also going to be some fallacies that are more on that side of things that have to do with sincerity or insincerity um, or abusiveness and things like that. So I'll talk about that as we go. But um, the way that these lectures are going to work, it, and, and really the material itself, is like learning a bunch of little patterns. Like we're going to do, I think we're gonna, I've got about 32 that I want us to learn um, over the next sort of body of material the next week or so. Um, that you've got to work on this. Um, so we're, I'm just going to kind of describe each one. Actually, let me show you a little quick example here so you know what I'm talking about. Um, there's, uh, well, actually, before I say it, like I said a, a second ago, there are uh, a lot of different mistakes that fall under the informal fallacies. There's not a kind of systematic thing going on here. This is, um, they're all, there's mistakes all over the place, as diverse as, um, the different ways that we can positively reason, we can all these mistakes in reasoning too. So there's a lot of different things here. Edward Damer, the guy who wrote um, the Code of Intellectual Conduct, is also the guy who is responsible for writing the book Attacking Faulty Reasoning, which your selections for this module are taken from. There's a PDF um, of all the readings that I, I have assigned here. And he organizes all the fallacies under the principles from the Code of Intellectual Conduct that they're violating. Now, sometimes I disagree with him about where he locates some of these fallacies, and in some there are some um, principles on the code that don't get connected with any particular fallacies. So, you know, this is maybe there's some controversy we could talk about. But the general idea here, I really appreciate from Edward Damer that um, we should look at the fallacies not just as uh, mistakes to be like, ha ha, gotcha. But really, we want to understand why is it a problem? Why is the fallacious reasoning wrong? Not just to know that it's wrong, but to know why that it's wrong. So that we know what to do instead, what's the positive thing that we should be doing, but also to help encourage other people um, to, uh, have, uh, to make better arguments and to reason and to argue in a better way without chastising them, without being like, uh, whistle, <laughs> foul on this person, get out of here, kind of thing. Like that... That's probably the biggest thing that I would emphasize here about this unit personally as your instructor um, is that, uh, um, well, I think maybe I've, I've told this story before to you that I sometimes feel teaching this class like I'm an arms dealer, like I'm giving you weapons for reasoning, and I don't know how you're necessarily going to use them, whether you'd use them responsibly or not. I've met many, many philosophy majors who um, you know, very enthusiastically want to increase their reasoning skills study the informal fallacies are like, oh, this is so awesome, what a useful tool, uh, and then promptly use their knowledge and wisdom that they have now gained as a weapon to beat other people over the head with. And that's not right. I mean, to go into a debate just looking to catch people in a bunch of fallacies and then to call them out on the carpet for it, that's not the, how these are intended to be used. Um, Edward Damer does another thing which helps with dealing with this problem, which is that at the end of each of these sort of encyclopedia entries on each of the different fallacies, after describing them, giving a definition, examples, all that kind of stuff, he's got a little section on attacking the fallacy, which is advice about how to respond when someone uses this fallacy against you in a debate. And um, I really like what he's doing with this. I've got some criticism of his replies, too. Sometimes I think he's a little... Uh, cold and uncompassionate about what might be going on if someone uses a bad, this kind of bad, a certain these certain types of bad reasoning, like some of the fallacies, I like his answers more than others. But in my lectures, I've tried to supplement that too, and try to give some advice about how to handle this. And um, the main goal here is in trying to recover the debate, to see that use of fallacies threatens what we're here to accomplish, to try to get at the truth and, each, and treat each other and ourselves ethically. And when people use fallacies, they're getting in the way of those positive goals. So if you want to call out fallacies as wrong, the way that you go about that better be promoting those two goals as well. That also should be um, our two priorities that we keep, even in attacking fallacies. 
So I'm going to talk, you're going to hear me talk a lot about um, uh, some things from my experience or just thinking about it um, um, and uh, some advice about what to do. And that's not going to be on the exam, of course, but it is important for real life. So I really encourage you to um, learn this stuff, but learn it, you know, knowledge is power and power can be used for good and bad. So I would encourage you to use this power for good. Um, I've seen a lot of trolls that definitely took a philosophy class and they are not using it for productive purposes. So um, be careful about that. Okay, so into my lecture notes here. Um, like I was saying, Edward uh, Damer uh, puts these into, he, he kind of organizes the fallacies under these different principles from the Code of Intellectual Conduct. I repeat them for you. Um, so the, the underlined non-bolded sections here are um, the uh, principles from the Code of Intellectual Conduct that sort of are the chapters of the reading that you're doing. Um, then there might be some other categories like the, the begging the question fallacies. It's not bolded, which means it's not one of these things that's going to be on the list of uh, matching things for the exam. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So each of the, each of the bolded sections here, this is one of the fallacies that you're going to have to learn. And I give you a definition. Um, there's some points here that I'll be talking through in my lectures. And then I give some suggestions here about how to deal with this fallacy. Um, and depending on time here, I might do more or less of these, um, kind of see how it goes. But I do encourage you to take a look at my lecture notes on your own too, um, just in case there's some stuff I, I don't get to, around to talking about, um, that which might happen. There's still some good stuff here. Um, so that's what you've got to look forward to. And then there's, you know, there's going to be a ton of these different things, so 32, I think. Um, so we're going to be learning a lot. They're split into two different lecture notes, lecture six and seven. So there's a first big batch here, and then there's an, a second big batch. So um, that's what's going to be happening here. On the exam, on the third exam, I'm going to just give you the list of all the fallacies, and then I'm going to give you some examples of people talking or someone giving an argument or something like that. And all you've got to do is match the fallacy with the example that is guilty of that fallacy. Now, that's all simple. Here's where things get complicated, and here's where my warnings begin. So as you're approaching this material, be careful, be on guard about a couple of things. First thing, which we're going to deal with right away with an example from the begging, the question begging fallacies, some fallacies are kind of organized into groups. So for example, here, let me get on my little whiteboard again. Um, right at the beginning here, we're going to talk about the question begging fallacies, and there's one fallacy that kind of describes the whole family, and that's arguing in a circle. But then within this general category of question begging, we're going to have um, a few more types. We're going to have, and I'm just going to, uh, well, yeah, let's spell it out. Why not? Um, question begging, um, question begging language. complex question and question begging um, whoop, definition. All right, so each of these you can imagine as its own kind of category here. too pretty all the time. All right, so you can think about it like these different categories. And the thing is, on the exam, there's going to be one problem for each. Okay, And you're going to be allowed to use each answer once and only once. And that's where things kind of get more complicated. Because if you've got these kind of nested structures of categories and subcategories of fallacies like these four, then Anything that's question begging language, question begging definition, or complex question would count as, as an instance of arguing in a circle. Anything that's in this category is also in this category. So you've got to be careful in keeping an eye out for what I've, I'm going to call sort of more general and more um, specific fallacies. So arguing in a circle. This is a big general category of fallacies. And complex question, question begging definition, and question begging language, these are more specific. 
There's other fallacies that aren't going to be in these nested structures, but they might be like really specific. So they're, the fallacy is describing a very narrow idiosyncratic type of reasoning mistake, whereas other fallacies are going to cover a like great deal of territory. Sometimes two fallacies might overlap. There might be a case that actually counts as guilty of both. That kind of stuff can happen um, too. Um, so you've got to keep an eye out for all these little idiosyncrasies. When you're taking the exam, I'm going to be asking you to give me the best fit answer. But there's a few tips that you can kind of keep in mind that will help you with getting that best fit answer the best. First, my first advice is to read through all the problems before putting a, even a single answer. And I'll definitely remind you about this when I do the exam uh, video, the intro video for the exam. But I want to tell you about it now, too. So read all the problems before you take the exam, before you put any answers down. Because you might see one thing, and you're like, oh, this is this. But then maybe later down the exam, there's a better, there's an example that's a better fit for that fallacy. But you may have already like written it off or, or scratched it out or something on your list. So you got to be careful about that. The other piece of advice is to try to identify all the specific fallacies first, leaving the general fallacies for later. Because the general fallacies are going to fit into more cases. Um, but the specific ones will only work for a certain thing. So kind of going back to what I was just talking about here, let's say you got a problem that in, is really the problem I've designed for complex question. If you wrote arguing for a circle, well, that's right. But now you've used up arguing for a circle. And um, complex question will have to attach to some other problem it doesn't belong to, and that one will be wrong. I actually do give credit. If, you, for, if there was the complex question fallacy problem, and you wrote arguing in a circle, I'll give you credit for that because technically that's absolutely, I mean, it is arguing in a circle. It's not wrong. It's not wrong. But the problem is now you're going to have to, you're going to be forced to throw a complex question onto something else that it, that there, there's no way it could be. Uh, and then you'll miss that point. So that's usually how it'll work. It wouldn't be that you'd miss two points. It might, it might be that you miss one point. Um, so watch out for that. I'll also be giving lots of tips along the way here for distinguishing fallacies that are easily confused with each other, which there's some of these sorts of things. Like whenever you've got a family of fallacies like happens here with the question begging fallacies there's the risk of that so I'll give you some tips along the way but those are the big those are the big general ones especially keep in mind this sort of like wanting to identify the more specific fallacies first and the general ones later so keep tracking what are the fallacies like what does it take to be guilty of this fallacy how many cases would actually uh, qualify as fitting under this you don't have to count them you can do that but we can tell which ones are sort of mistakes that are more common that a lot of things could be classified as, and things that are more specific and narrow. Um, and you have to be doing this very specific type of thing to be guilty of that fallacy. Okay, so enough introduction. Let's get started with some fallacies. And let's start with the question begging fallacies. Okay. All right, so in this um, structural principle from the Code of Intellectual Conduct, um, there's a certain part of it, um, this part about arguments must not use reasons that contradict each other, contradict the conclusion, or that explicitly or implicitly assume the truth of the conclusion. It's that part of the structural principle that we're going to be focusing on um, for these question begging fallacies. Um, it's, it's that, that's the thing that's going to be problematic here. Um, and circular reasoning is something that I think we, we already have some intuitions is wrong. Um, there are some pretty blatant cases of it. Uh, that we uh, almost always recognize as problematic. Like if I say, um, I'm right, and you're like, why? And I'm like, because I'm right. No, no one's going to be like, oh, yeah, a good argument. That's a good point, yeah. I wasn't convinced before, but now I am. That's, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. No one's going to buy that. Or if we just say it's true because it's true. It's just true. Why is this a fact? Because it's a fact. And that's it. Um, any of that kind of stuff is going to be really blatant and obvious, and no one's going to ever fall for it. Um, but there's a lot of forms of that same problem, that same kind of circularity in your reasoning, that um, uh, are harder to detect. And that's what the, those are the other sorts of cases, the implicitly assuming the truth of the conclusion. That's the problem. Okay? And let's just get really straight on what circular reasoning is. It's presupposing that of uh, the truth of your conclusion in how you defend it which if I say this is true because it's true conclusion premise well definitely 
to give the argument to the conclusion is to presuppose the truth of it directly because we're repeating the claim. Okay, so that's definitely that. But there's other versions of this that aren't going to be that so that's so, so straightforward. And that there's there's other ways other than just repeating the claim that you could be guilty of taking the truth of your conclusion for granted. So here, let's take a look at um, the definition we get here um, from arguing in a circle. Again, this is this is the like big arguing in a circle is the fallacy that kind of describes this whole family. And then we're going to talk about more specific ways of making that general problem, uh, making that general mistake. So either explicitly or implicitly asserting in the premise of an argument what is asserted in the conclusion of that argument. So, in, and again, cases of rephrasing or um, are, are very, that, that's probably the next ste step of complication. So the first level of simplicity here of arguing in a circle is just to repeat the claim. Then the next one would be when the claim is getting repeated but it's being worded differently when it appears again. And, and this one's pretty common because uh, you know all of us are taught in our English classes that if you're going to say the same thing again, which you often have to do, you should try to use a different way of articulating it to make your writing more interesting. And that's nice from an aesthetic point of view, um, but it can contribute to this sort of problem with critical reasoning where because it's different words, we might not recognize that it's the exact same idea. So this is where, again, we have to be more concerned about ideas rather than words, which is a theme in this class. You've heard me say that a few times. Um, and by a few, I mean quite a bit. Um, so this is another instance of that. But there's even more subtle things from there. Let me give you an example of one of my favorite arguing in a circle examples. And, and um, again, this is, this is, so here's actually one thing I wanted to say sooner or later. This is the right time, I think. Um, I love Edward Damer's book. I think it's really good. I think he does a great job describing these fallacies. But if there's one big criticism I have of the book uh, that I would want you to take it with a grain of salt is that it's a little, um, and again, I, I use this word, I want to use this very, word very carefully, but I think it's a little biased in how it selects its examples. At the very least, it's just the, the mistakes, like when he gives examples of these mistakes in reasoning, they tend to come from the conservative and religious end of the spectrum um, perspectives that are kind of on that side um, and that's that's not right um, it sends the wrong per, uh, message here about um, who is guilty of these kinds of rational mistakes and who is maybe reasoning well right and the thing about reasoning is that reasoning is not a matter whether you're doing a good job reasoning or not does not have that much to do with what conclusion you're defending. Reasoning is about how you defend it. Now it does, we do care about what conclusions we want to draw because we have to draw the right conclusions based off of the the evidence we have available to reason with. Okay, so we can, it's not like I'm saying it doesn't matter what you believe. Truth seeking is what critical reasoning is all about and trying to get at the right conclusions is the thing that we care about. But in terms of figuring out the reasoning part of this, the inference part, when we draw a conclusion based on something, that we're like, these claims, if true, prove this other thing, the support relation stuff. That doesn't depend so much, whether you're using good methodology there or not, is not something that's specific to some perspectives versus others. Um, there are definitely some perspectives that there are more people in the world that maybe are um, inclined to... Uh, defend those positions that have more training or education or skill with it, and there's some that are less. Um, there are some positions that maybe attract people who are not thinking as carefully or something like that, but we need to be careful about uh, guilt by association here creeping into things, um, because uh, all of the, let's just take things like um, religious versus secular, or atheist, or agnostic, and non-religious. I've seen people on both sides and all these camps guilty of the same kinds of rational mistakes, the same kinds of flawed reasoning, um, and able to make good arguments in the same sort of way. Um, same thing I've seen on different parts of the political spectrum, and I know this is kind of loaded right now, but um, I've, I've seen it. I've seen the same kinds of tendencies show up, the same kinds of um, bad argumentative practices show up on both sides, and the same uh, flaws in reasoning show up on both sides too. Um, so I don't think you can say that you're a critical reasoner or a good critical reasoner 
based on the positions you're defending. I think it's a lot more about how you're defending them, and that's a lot more open. So Edward's book does not do a good enough job um, giving the right message here about this. So I wish that there were there was a little more uh, diversity of example here. But but still, it's a very good book. Otherwise, the descriptions are great. The examples he chooses are good illustrations of this kind of bad reasoning. I like the homework problems a lot. So the, there's a lot of things I like about the book, but this is just this is kind of a black mark on it. Um, and I can tell you, man, uh, eh, whew, there's a lot of critical reasoning textbooks out there, and all of them have something. You know, it's kind of like pick your poison. There's always something that's kind of dissatisfying to me about it. It's hard to pick reading materials. So, but this this one's pretty good. Just that that's one thing I'm sad about. Okay, so I said all that because. I needed to say it sooner or later, but I was about to give an example that was built from religion um, as, that, as an example of arguing in a circle in a little more subtle way. And so again, this is not to just say, you know, religious people are bad critical reasoners or something like that. I've told you I'm religious, so, um, you know, and actually there's a way to fix the argument that I'm about to offer that's bad to make it good, which is actually to take another tangent here really quickly, a big part of my advice in the lecture notes um, and stuff I'll be trying to talk about but may not have a ton of time for which is that a lot of times if someone is guilty of using a fallacy in reasoning, it's, you don't have to just throw their whole argument in the trash. There's ways to recover and fix it. And use some charity. Help out your opponent here. This is a collaborative activity between you and your opponent of seeking the truth. So help them out. Don't just look for excuses to write them off. That's, that's a wrong way to use the informal fallacies, at like the whistleblowing, get out of here sort of thing. Um, that's not keeping score and stuff. That's not the point. The point is to get at the truth. That's the whole point of this. Okay, so here's the example. Conclusion, God exists. Premise, um, to, someone asks, like, well, why should I believe that God exists? Well, here's a reason. The Bible says so, and the Bible's the word of God. Now, um, there, this, uh, this, this argument is not straightforwardly circular, but here's the problem. Um, if I'm saying that the authority of Scripture comes from the fact that it's the word of God, then I'm presupposing that the conclusion is already true, that God exists. That's the problem. Now this kind of reasoning is something we're guilty of a lot. Why? Because we don't recognize that there's a priority here about what we're deriving from what. We've got our perspective and it all hangs together. We've got all of our beliefs and they make sense with each other. I mean, if you believe in God and then you and you believe that the Bible is the word of God, then it's going to be trustworthy, you know, based on what, what we're defining God as. If he's like perfectly good, then you know, he's not going to be screwing with people or something like that, and laughing at them. That's, that's not what we believe. So if you believe in that God existing, then and you believe the Bible is the word of God, then that makes it pretty trustworthy. That make that gives it a bunch of authority. But if we're looking for an argument for why we should believe God exists, we can't presuppose the thing we're trying to prove. Okay? So I've got a lot of compassion for this. This is the way in which I think this shows up in all perspectives. That when you're looking at the world from a certain perspective, you see the stuff that reinforces that, and you kind of it all just hangs together. We just associate ideas, and we're not careful to think about when we're associating them, what kind of relationship are they in? Is this the basis on which I prove that this is true, or the other way around? You know, we don't we don't necessarily think about it. We're just like, oh, these things go together, and we don't think more critically. So um, that's a good example of arguing in a circle in this more subtle way of, in order for the argument that's being presented to work, it relies on the conclusion already being posited as true. That's the problem. And this problem can take an even more subtle version, which comes into um, question begging language, which is the one I want to talk about next. So um, the book says the definition is this, discussing an issue by means of language that assumes a position on the very question at issue in such a way as to direct the listener to that same conclusion. Now there's a couple things to, that, that might be a difficult um, description to uh, kind of put some thoughts to, to get an idea and handle on how to detect question begging language. Um, there's, but there's, I've, got, I've got some help for this. There's kind of two different ways that we do this. Um, one of them is by using uh, thick evaluative terms, um, or what book described before, the, our other book, described as spin doctoring. So do you remember the, the thick concepts are words that describe and evaluate. 
So if we're making an argument and we're trying to speak to a certain fact, um, let's say we're having a dispute about the appropriateness of the U.S. military operations in Iraq before. Um, remember, and we remember that example of invasion versus liberation of Iraq. If someone used that kind of language as a part of describing, just, just the, when they're describing the U.S. military operations in Iraq, like, well, when the U.S. Army liberated Iraq, blah, 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 some of the other stuff for the argument. Now, that language itself isn't automatically, it's not circular in the sense of um, assuming the thing that you're proving. But in order for the language to be accurate, the conclusion would have to already be true. And it's, it's just problematic because we're worried about how spin doctoring might suggest a conclusion without actually providing any support for it. It's that's that's the whole concern about spin doctoring is that the angle, the bias, if you will, or something, is um, is hidden, and it influences how we feel about certain ideas um, without maybe being as overt about what we're actually claiming, and that's a problem. Um, my favorite way of kind of giving you an image or metaphor for uh, question begging language and the thick concept thing this fits perfectly for is um, is the idea of trash talking like on uh, in a sporting game like say you're playing basketball and you know there's a lot of there's a lot of trash talk going on and trash talk is like posturing as if you've already won the game prior to winning the game you're like you guys suck we're so much better than you you don't even have a chance we're gonna wipe the court with you blah 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 all of that is presenting a picture as if your team has already been proven to be the better team, when that's exactly what we have yet to prove. You have to play the game to figure out who is better sort of thing. All right, So that's like how question-begging language works. It's talking about the arguments that you're making, or the language that you're using in your arguments, in such a way as if you're kind of posturing as though your conclusion has already been proven. Um, so that's a problem. So that's what I, I would say. You can listen for that. Listen for um, loaded language in someone's premises and how they're defending their conclusion that is loaded in the way that takes for granted what the position is about. So notice in the example I gave about the U.S. military operations in Iraq, I had to say that the conclusion in that example is about the appropriateness of those actions because then the kind of extra content that you get that's loaded into um, words like liberation or invasion pertains to the issue that's under that's under discussion, that's under debate, that's controversial, whether the conclusion is true or false. Okay, so um, that's the first type of, of uh, question begging language that you can look out for. There's a second type too, and it's a leading question. And um, this is not to be confused with complex question. They both involve questions, but in a different way. So in in the leading question, this is where someone is asking a question in such a way that presupposes what's the proper answer. So it's again like it's like the it's 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 in the category of question begging language, because you know you're asking the question and you're not maybe literally saying here's a question which I'm now going to give you the right answer for, but the the language of it it's colored the rhetoric of the question uh, or maybe your body language of tone of voice. Is suggestive. It implies what you. It's you kind of pushing someone into what the um, what you think the right answer is. Um, so one of my favorite examples, and just to kind of kind of balance things up from Edwards' political slant, let's use let's use Democrats here instead of Republicans. But if someone was like, "You're going to vote Democrat, right? Right? You didn't possibly vote for Trump, did you?" Or something like that. That way of asking the question is not neutral. It's like, so how did you vote in the election? I'm, I'm curious. I'd like to know. You're, you're kind of um, suggesting what you think would be the appropriate answer in how you're asking the question. Um, so that's, that's also question-begging language. Um, that's problematic, too. So um, keep in mind those two different ways that could count as question-begging language. Um, uh, I'm happy telling you right now that the problem for question begging language on the exam only does one of those two things. So, but you got to be prepared to be look, looking for both. Um, and sometimes it's one, and sometimes it's the other. So, you can look out for it. But I hope I hope you can see that both of those examples still count as question begging language because they're using rhetoric and word choices or tone of voice or style to be suggestive of the thing of resolving the thing that is still controversial. 
okay, and that's that's the problem. Okay, since we were just talking about it, let's go to complex question next. Maybe is that next on my list? Oh yes, so it is. Um, oh yeah, let me give you some advice here on question begging language. This is kind of uh, there's a kind of bullying I think that's implicit in question begging language all the time. Uh, we talked about abusive discounting before. When we talk about discounting, this is kind of the ugly way of using discounting. Like only an idiot would think that. But really, this could be kind of almost like abusive affirmation. Okay, question begging language often works this way. Um, so I would, when someone's using question begging language, I mean, what you can do is try to pull the things apart. Like that, when someone uses a thick evaluative term, like pull out the part that is taking for granted the position they're already trying to prove. You can like retranslate things into neutral language for your for your uh, conversational partner. Um, but also, uh, like the book says, like resist being bullied um, and, and stand up for it. Be like, sometimes it can help to show the person that the language that they're using is posturing as if they've already won the debate. But that the whole point of the debate is to try to actually explore it sincerely. Um, I think one of the antidotes to um, question begging is charity, is coming up with arguments for the side of your opponent. Um, to make them stronger. That forces you to try to listen to recognize that there's still a controversy here, that there is something here that you have to work hard at to defend. Uh, you can't just repeat your position in order to make it right. I think the other principle here that's probably very important is the fallibility principle to recognize, and the burden of proof principle. And there's a lot of ones that actually are relevant here now that I'm thinking about it. But to recognize that you might be wrong and that you need to take responsibility for defending your claims. Um, so rather than posturing as if it's obvious that you're right and how could anyone ever disagree with you, have some modesty with it and recognize and go looking for how might someone disagree with this rather than just being like, doesn't make sense to me. Be like, well, what, where, could, where could someone be coming from where that would make sense? Okay, so that's what I have to say about that. All right, let's talk about complex question now. Um, this is different from leading question. In that complex question, uh, well, there are two forms of complex question to watch out for here. Um, one, way, one way to be guilty of complex question is to take two uh, different questions and lump them together. So basically you're forcing your, uh, the person you're asking the question to to respond to both questions together. So, um, oh, I think I've got, what's my example here? Yeah, will you let me, um, will you take me home tonight and let me pick up some things from the grocery store on the way? You know, if the person says yes, they're saying yes to both. If they say no, they're saying no to both. Um, so the thing that's being presupposed here that's controversial, the, the aspect that's question begging, is when you lump the two questions together like that, you're taking it for granted that they're going to have the same answer, that they are relevant to each other, that it's not possible to say yes to one part and no to the other part, or that they could just receive different answers. So that's what makes it a case of arguing in a circle in the case of question begging generally, is that it's um, taking for granted something that is still yet to be defended. It's still a part of the controversy that needs to be defended. Okay. The other way that you can be guilty, and it's been always, uh, I love this, this one is hilarious. There's a lot of wonderful examples out there of this type of version of complex question. Um, but what goes on in the second version is when you, you ask a question that uh, the question only makes sense if you're presupposing an answer to another, a second unasked question um, that would be about something kind of controversial. There's a lot of times we ask questions that depend on um, on uh, other things being true, but that maybe it's okay for us to assume, like they're uncontroversial facts that everyone agrees to. No one's really making us think about it. Like if I'm like, when is the sun going to come up tomorrow? That's presupposing that the sun will come up tomorrow. But that's not really a problem um, in as much as no one's interested in arguing against that. Uh, it's not a very controversial claim to think that the sun will go up tomorrow, and it's just a matter of when. But take a case like this. If I uh, accost you and I'm like, what did you do with my watch after you stole it? I'm asking for what did you do with the watch after you stole it, but that question only makes sense under the presumption that you stole my watch. I'm taking that for granted in how I ask the question. Um, and there's really no good answer to the question other than to try to change the question, right, or to point that out. And that's one of the main ways of responding to this fallacy is to uh, point out to your partner that you can separate these two issues or point out the thing that they're taking for granted and asking the question. 
Um, but both of those are complex questions. They're both guilty of question begging. They're taking something for granted that's controversial that needs to be defended. Okay, so that's complex question. Oh man, oh yeah, this one happened. Like I got this one from my mom for a long time. When are you gonna settle down and get married? Presupposes that I am gonna get married, and actually I had some issues with marriage, um, and I I didn't want to get married for a long time. I actually am married now, but only legally. Um, I don't want to participate in the social conventions around it. If you want to talk to me about that sometime, it's a very interesting ethical debate. But, you know, for my mom, it's like, just, of course you're going to get married. Of course you're going to do that. When are you going to have kids? Be like, of course you're going to have kids. The only question is when. These sorts of things. And um, those are real questions. There are real controversies. Those are things that maybe people make different decisions about and evaluate in different ways than you would. So you got to watch out for that. Come, uh, question begging is all about presupposing things that are controversial and that the solution to avoiding question begging is to go looking for the controversy respect controversy be interested in it it helps you to find out more about the truth to to want to talk and engage with those perspectives that are different than yours rather than just dismissing them or laughing them off or ignoring them or only talking to people who agree with you stuff like that um, okay one more um, one more fallacy here in the question begging family. Question begging definition. Let's look at the book's definition here. Using a highly questionable definition disguised as an irrefutable empirical premise, which has the effect of making the empirical claim at issue true by definition. Now, I don't like this. I don't like this definition. Um, and I don't like this way of talking about it. Um, I want to give you a different way of thinking about question begging definition, because this is much too narrow of a descriptor. There are other ways that you can be guilty of question begging definition other than how uh, Edward has, has articulated it here in his definition. And actually, um, the thing that has sort of taught me this has been teaching philosophy 101, because um, I make my students write original philosophy papers in, in my 101 class, and I see a lot of question begging definition happening in student papers. And I think it's a very natural thing. Again, I'm, it's, I don't think it's necessarily malicious. I think it's just a kind of common mistake that we make. But the problem here, um, this is how I would describe the problem of question begging definition, and maybe you can see how this would fit cases that don't just have to do with empirical premises. But the problem of question begging definition is presenting a controversy as if it's um, not a substantial one, that is, if it's only a linguistic dispute when really there's a more substantial disagreement taking place. So to misrepresent a substantial disagreement as really a difference in how we use language, that's the problem of question begging definition. So let me give you an example uh, or kind of a picture from that I get from a lot of these 101 papers. Um, so a lot of them are like defining their terms. So they got a position they're trying to defend in the paper. They got a thesis, right, that they're defending. Um, and they start rattling off definitions. So they're like, by justice, I mean this, or by freedom, I mean this, or whatever. And then after they've defined all their terms, they've defined the, the terms that they're using in such a way that their thesis has to be true just based on how the meaning of those words have been defined. So they, they've sort of defined their thesis into existence rather than argued for it, rather than presented reasons for why we should think their definitions are correct or why we should look at it from the way they they just been like by this I mean this by this I mean this by this I mean this so what else my conclusion must be true because that's what these words mean <laughs> um, so that's that's a problem it, it's sort of when people are guilty of question begging definition they're sort of like accusing their opponents of being wrong because they don't understand English that they're like using the wrong definition of English and uh, I've talked about this before, how sometimes we talk past each other because we have different definitions in mind when we use different words. We have different ideas in mind when we use diff when we use even the same word. Um, and that's just gonna that's gonna make for some confusion and miscommunication. But we can sort that out. Um, but sorting that out is not to give an argument. I mean, to clarify my position is not to defend it. To just talk a lot about how I see things doesn't argue for anything. But a lot of times I think we confuse advocacy with argument, and it isn't. Argument only happens when you're supporting your claims. And by supporting, it means 
making other truth claims that, if true, give a reason to believe that the conclusion is true, like we've talked about before. That's the idea of a, of a support relation. It's not just saying things that make someone more inclined to agree with you. That's persuasion. That's not argument. That's rhetoric, not reasoning. Okay? So we've got to be careful about that. That's some of the stuff that I think is behind question begging definition. It's a very common sort of mistake. Um, it's totally great to clarify terms. I mean, define your terms, especially if you're writing a paper and you use words in a way where you know other people might use those words in different ways. Clarify your position. Just recognize the definition has proven nothing. I always am fond of saying the dictionary is one of the worst philosophers ever <laughs> because you can't just define things like freedom or justice based off what a dictionary definition is. It's not just a linguistic competency that's un that makes for disagreement here. It's that there's a substantially different perspective about what justice is all about. What does it mean? Um, and to reduce that controversy to something so trivial as not understanding the definition of words, like go buy a dictionary, that kind of thing, is what is what makes question begging definition question begging. Um, it's, again, kind of ignoring that there's a real controversy here to be addressed. So that's the problem. Okay. So those are the question begging fallacies. I kind of want to get a couple more fallacies in here before this video is up. So let's let's do a couple more here. But just keep in mind that Again, as we close out um, question begging fallacies, there's four of them, and some of them are more specific than others. So be careful with that. Um, keep that in mind. It, every case of question begging language is a case of arguing in a circle, and there's going to be other relationships like this as we go through more of the fallacies. Okay. So on to our next fallacies. Um, these are the relevance fallacies. We're going to move into the relevance principle. Um, but there's going to be two subcategories here. There's fallacies of a relevant premise, and then fallacies of a relevant appeal. And let's talk about the fallacies of a relevant premise first. These are cases where someone is arguing for a conclusion using premises which are irrelevant for the conclusion, but not irredeemably so. In other words, uh, like I say here, irrelevant appeals... Um, generally wouldn't, so in contrast to irrelevant premise, the fallacies of irrelevant premise, the ones of irrelevant appeal uh, wouldn't work for any argument. It doesn't matter the conclusion. With um, fallacies of irrelevant premise, it's just, you know, for this conclusion, these this premise is not capable of providing relevant support, but it might work for something else. So, um, whoa, so, um, sorry, that's some board game stuff. Um, so I've got a conclusion. I'm arguing for it with certain premises. If I'm guilty of a fallacy of a relevant premise, then it's like this premise is irrelevant for this conclusion. But we could have taken this conclusion out. Maybe there's another conclusion here that actually this premise would work as evidence for. In contrast to this, the second one, the second category of fallacies of a relevant appeal are the kinds of appeals that, of evidence that actually don't count for anything. They wouldn't be irrelevant evidence for any conclusion. They're like bad reasoning patterns that are just always bad, rather than certain premises that just don't work in this particular case. Um, so let's uh, let's talk about uh, genetic fallacy. Will be a great illustration of of one of these fallacies of a relevant premise here. Before we get to fallacies of a relevant appeal, um, actually, you know, just as like to illustrate this distinction, here's a here's a really good example of a fallacy of, of irrelevant appeal from the second category we'll look at later. So skipping ahead here. Um, appeal to force or threat, a.k.a. bullying. Attempting to persuade others of a position by threatening them with an undesirable state of affairs instead of presenting evidence for one's view. That's never right. Bullying never presents a good argument. So that's why it's a fallacy of irrelevant appeal. The fallacies of irrelevant premise, like genetic fallacy, are going to be, you know, they're bad arguments, but they, uh, the premise could work for something. So let's, let's take a look at genetic fallacy. Evaluating a thing in terms of its earlier context and then carrying over that evaluation to the thing in the present while ignoring relevant changes that may have altered its character in the interim. All right, now in more ordinary language, this is saying you're guilty of the genetic fallacy when you're using the past to inform judgments like what happened in the past, you're using that as evidence for what you should think is true now 
or sometime in the future, like making future predictions. And that on its own, not a problem. The problem comes next. Doing that while ignoring the possibility of relevant changes that could have happened in the intervening time from the historical evidence that you're appealing to, to now or into the future. Okay, It's that ignoring of the possibility of change part that's really the thing that's problematic because it's not a fallacy to learn from the past. right? You put your hand on a hot stove, get burned, you're like, I'm not doing that again. If I do it again, the same thing will happen. That's not irrational. There's nothing wrong about that. The problem is when we ignore or don't address the possibility of change. So if I think, you know, I put my hand on a hot stove before, and I got burned. I think it's going to happen again. But why? It's not just that it happened before, it'll happen again. But also, the kinds of things that might make it different, I'm probably not going to affect the outcome. Like, a hot stove is still going to be hot. I mean, unless they can make hot stoves that don't burn? How is that supposed to work? You know, I can't, I'm thinking, well, how could anything change over the technology of how stoves work that would make it so if I put my hand on a hot stove, I won't get burned? Probably not, because the whole point is to get the things hot that you put on the stove, right? But, so, and we might not think that through explicitly, but um, that would be a part of the logic of that reasoning that would make it good reasoning. Okay, so here's an example I like to use of genetic fallacy. Um... When I was younger, my brother used to be, um, he'd always try to get my goat. He'd always, uh, my younger brother would always try to pester me and, and do annoying things to me. He liked to be kind of manipulated. He was kind of like a little walking troll. And a lot of kids are like that. Um, and I don't blame him about it now or anything like that. But let, let's, so I, um, you know, I moved out, went to college. And then uh, my brother uh, went to college and then. Um, went overseas and taught English in Asia for a great many years. He actually just got back last year. It's very really nice to have him around. But I hadn't seen him for a long time. And I didn't reason this way, but let's imagine I did. I was like, man, last time I saw my brother, he was still really annoying. He was, he, you know, didn't really, he seemed more interested in just trying to abuse me and manipulate me than to, you know, care about me. He, he's probably the same manipulative jerk now that he was before. If I reasoned that way, I'd be making a mistake of genetic fallacy. Um, if I leave it at that, the problem of genetic fallacy is the absence of something. Not a positive mistake, but this is kind of like a negative mistake. It's a, it's a sin of omission rather than a sin of commission. Because I'm thinking about what my brother was like when he was a kid. And now I'm making a judgment about him now in the, as he's an adult. I mean, he's like 30 now, right? Um, or th I think he was 30 when he came back from Egypt. Now he's 31, I think. But um, there's a lot of opportunity for someone to change after going to college, going abroad, working all these jobs, going to all these countries, and just the natural part of getting older and maturing that might affect whether or not he has those personality characteristics. So I have to acknowledge that he might he might still be the jerk, but I need to think about what would be the opportunities that might have changed his personality and did those things happen or not? So we need to think about that. If we're going to use the past to inform the present, we're like, things you know, were like this before so they'll continue to be like that. We need to pay attention and see whether there are some other changes that have happened. Another great example of genetic fallacy is when um, people use what happened in the past in economics to make judgments about what was would be proper economic policy or strategy today. Like how markets worked in the 1920s is very different from how markets work today. Um, and there's some ways we could learn lessons from the 20s, but we gotta, if we're gonna make the connections, we always have to be thinking about whether some other things have changed along the way that might make that no longer true. And if you address that, then you're not guilty of genetic fallacy. So that means if someone is guilty of genetic fallacy, it's easy to help them out. It's easy to help them fix it. All you got to do is think about addressing, like bring up the possibilities of change and be like, do you have any reason for thinking that maybe these things different didn't happen? Because you kind of have to think about that. If you want to use the past to inform the present, you got to think about the possibility of change. And you can help them do that. Um, it's a very easy fallacy to fix because all you have to do is do more than what you were doing before to fix it. So that's genetic fallacy. I don't think there's too many other things I want to say about it. Like, this happens a lot with a lot of these. I'm saying there's probably a halfway decent inductive argument in the neighborhood, even if someone is guilty of genetic fallacy. 
Um, the past does give some evidence for the future, right? Um, so help your partner do that. Help them work with that. Okay, let's do one more here. Let's do rationalization, then we'll call it a night, because uh, this one's actually kind of a big one. Okay, so rationalization is using plausible sounding but usually fake reasons to justify a particular position that's held on other less respectable grounds. This is another case where the definition I think could be better. Um, I like I say the book makes this seem more clear cut than it usually is um, because there is a fine line between giving reasons and rationalizing. And then I've got some I've got some advice here. So let's keep my lecture notes up and let me talk through this because I think rationalization is really a flaw of a person rather than a flaw with an argument. An argument cannot really be rationalizing, but the motives of someone who is giving an argument could definitely be rationalizing. Um, the, 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 the antidote to rationalization is truth-seeking, the truth-seeking principle on the Code of Intellectual Conduct, which says that your purpose must be to get at the truth, rather than some ulterior motive, like trying to not look stupid or trying to get something out of someone, like to be manipulative or something like that. There's all sorts of reasons we have for arguing that don't have to do with the truth. And rationalization is sort of a, a fallacy where I'm not interested in giving the reasons that are compelling for why we should believe that something is true. I've already decided what I want to believe is true, and now I'm just looking for excuses. That's rationalization. Um, it's very, very hard to... Um, Detect this, as I, I mentioned down here. Detecting this can be tough. I, I, I kind of want to speak to you about this because I, you know, this is this is not impersonal stuff. I think rationalization is a very deeply human fallacy, um, and I, I want the, the the words I'm about to say. I, I wanted to say to you as a person, um, and this is a little bit of like Tim advice here too. So maybe I'll turn my hat. Um, I think we need to be very very careful about accusing people of insincerity. And the main thing that's on my radar, which I've mentioned before in my lectures at the beginning of the quarter on the Code of Intellectual Conduct, is that in my experience, when, a, when an argument or a debate heads into dangerous territory, it's when one party or the other believes the other one is insincere. And an accusation of insincerity uh, really threatens what can happen. Now, this isn't to say that we shouldn't call out bullshit when it's happening, but it means I think we should be careful about this. Um, if this is a flaw of a person to have this sort of ulterior motives or to have the, the wrong motivation behind your argumentative participation, that's a matter of attitude that you have to infer. This is like conversational act territory. It's about the inner intentions and goals of a person. You're not a mind reader. You don't get to see this. And you need to, I think it's important, my advice is to realize that the accusation of insincerity is a pretty deep charge and it's hard to have proof about it. It's really hard to have proof. It's very easy for us to misunderstand each other um, and to make assumptions about our intentions that are incorrect um, because of how we might be scared of each other, especially if we're debating with an opponent on something that we think is a really big deal um, that has a lot at stake or something like that or the nervousness of just the difficulty of being in a debate, like we've talked about before, all the the sources of anxiety that critical reasoning provokes. So there's there's a lot here that I would encourage us to have compassion for, and to be very careful about how we make accusations about this. Like I said, I don't think that you shouldn't call out bullshit, but there are different ways to go about doing this, and um, nothing is going to take the debate down faster than a misplaced accusation of insincerity, and even in, even a real one. And I, I'll, I'll have some other advice here about how to deal with rationalization. But the first thing to note about it, it just if you want to detect it, like especially if you're thinking, how do I watch out for rationalization on the exam? There's not an easy way to do it because this is a matter of making a judgment about someone's intentions and motives. It's not going to be obvious through their behavior. The behavior is our best indicator, but it's very rare that something is like super conclusive behavior. There's certain things you can watch out for, um, but got to be careful about that. So because it's a flaw with a person instead of an argument, um, that means that uh, you can't treat a certain perspective, like a conclusion, or a line of reasoning for that conclusion as automatically insincere. 
Okay? It's not like the connections between those ideas is an issue of insincerity. If, if the premise supports the conclusion, then it supports the conclusion. If it's a good argument, it's a good argument. If it doesn't support the conclusion, if it's invalid or un, it's not strong, then it's just not strong. When it comes to the ideas, sincerity is not in the picture. It's only when you have people who believe in ideas that now there's an issue of sincerity. Are you believing that because you just honestly, sincerely believe that it's true? And you have the best evidence for it, and your evidence that you've seen so far in your experience or knowledge or understanding leads you to that conclusion? Or is it that you kind of already decided what you wanted to believe and now you're looking for excuses for it? That's a matter of what's going on with people, not ideas. Okay? And there's some ideas that might be more commonly associated with insincerity, um, but you've got to be careful about that and to not be guilty of question begging, not taking for granted that your position is the only sincere position a person could hold. I mean, the reality is that you know, most of the disagreements that are worth having debates about are disagreements that happen, that or at least can happen between, and, or let me word it this way. Yeah, the can part's the important part here. That even people who are well-educated, informed, intelligent, um, charitable, um, sincere, good people in every way that we want, have all the intellectual virtues on the Code of Intellectual Conduct, even at that, and they're not guilty of any fallacies, they can still disagree. They can still have disagreements. That can certainly happen. Um, and most of the disagreements that worth having are the ones that happen in that sort of way. That like, I mean, most of the things I see philosophers debating, um, those they're all they're people that I believe have those characteristics. Not always. Philosophers are not saints. We don't always do it perfectly, but um, I've seen that happen a lot, even about the stuff that seems most loaded. Okay, so keep in mind rationalizations of flaw of a person. My, my best advice for detecting this, at least on the exam, I'm going to try to make it as obvious as possible that there's some insincerity going on. Um, one really good sign that someone is rationalizing is when they use what I call the shotgun method, where they just throw as many ideas and arguments as they can really quickly, throw everything against the wall, and hope something sticks. Um, if you if they give an argument and you're not buying it, then they like quickly switch gears to another argument. They're not interested in like really fleshing out that argument or showing why they find it so convincing. They're just like, okay, fine, let's try something else to see if I can get you convinced this way. That's a good sign that there's rationalization going on. That they're not engaging in the debate to truth seek, but they're really just trying to persuade you of something, and that's it. So watch out for that kind of um, throw spaghetti at the wall or or sh what I call the shotgun method. That that's a good sign of that rationalization is taking place. Um, I want to spend some time talking about how to respond to this. Um, oh, oh yeah, let's talk about this. Why is this a relevance fallacy? This is kind of an interesting explanation. Rationalization is categorized under relevance, uh, again, because it's kind of like an, a, a mistake of omission rather than a mistake of commission. Um, oftentimes, rationalizers are very clever, and they come up with great arguments but they're still rationalizing and still a problem. The argument is still good, but their motives are bad, and that's a problem. Um, and we could be concerned about that. Um, but, uh, oh, I just lost my train of thought. Just give me a second. It's too late. All right, how could I forget? It was, I was just talking about it. So, if someone is rationalizing, um, they're looking for excuses to win, right? So they're going to present arguments that support their position to try to convince you. But what they're going to do is leave certain things off the table. Anything that looks bad to their position, they're going to try to like sweep that under the rug, you know, hide that away somewhere. Um, that's their that. So it's rationalization will lead to issues of relevance because there will be relevant issues to the debate that won't get addressed, like concerns, possible concerns, and, and things of that nature. A, a rationalizer is going to like deflect attention away from the things that are seriously problematic. Um, if you're not interested in open truth-seeking, then you don't want to give your opponent any weapons. You're going to just try to run a PR campaign, right? Downplay your weaknesses and upsell your strengths, and that's how it works. Um, that's why the strategy I was talking about a second ago is a good indication of rationalizing, where the person, if they don't, if you're not buying the argument right away, then they just scrap it and move on to something else. The fact that they're willing to scrap it, that they're like, oh, hmm, yeah, maybe there's a problem with that argument. They don't want to look at it. They, if you're not going to buy it, if it's not going to work to convincing you, and that's all they really care about, then they try it something else instead. 
um, if they were sincere, if they were like, well, this is the argument while I'm convinced, and you're not buying it, then we should talk about that. We should explore that controversy and see what's really true. And do I have the right idea? Maybe I don't, right? So that that's the that's why that uh, practice is a good kind of should raise some red flags. Got to be careful about this. Now I got a lot of things I would want to say here about how to respond. Um, even when you're absolutely confident that someone is guilty of rationalizing, that they've got this kind of insincerity, I really encourage using this strategy of um, just introducing what is being left out. So if they're sweeping stuff under the rug or they're like moving on to a different topic, bring it back. Bring it back. Be like, oh, I'm really interested though. No, you gave this argument. Like, why did it convince you? Like, play play it aloof is my advice. It's a, it doesn't work in every situation, but I've seen this I've seen this strategy work very well. I used to use it a lot in college, uh, and actually I think it's kind of similar to how Socrates argues, incidentally. But just like Keep being sincere. Don't you know if the other person is showing that they're insincere, even in really blatant ways, just like pretend like you don't even see it, and just keep operating as a sincere person in the debate. You set, try to set the tone. Don't play into their game of insincerity. Don't bite on the troll. You know, don't don't feed the troll. Just keep being sincere. Just keep being like, oh, it's, well, I'm I'm going to try to use charity to understand your arguments as good as possible. I mean, if you can. Stay strong to that. If you can stick to your guns, um, sometimes you can just by doing that re resist the thing that they're trying to manipulate with. Um, if someone can make the debate devolve into rhetoric, then maybe they got a better chance of winning. But if you stick to arguments and being like, "How does this actually work as proof? Show it to me. I'm willing to listen." Then they actually have to do it. <laughs> you're not giving them any excuses for dismissing you either, um, as saying that you're insincere. Right. So I think that's a good thing. Here's the other reason why this strategy is good. Um, I'm sure you have maybe recognized at this point in life that I almost ran out of space here, so uh, I got to wrap this up quickly. Um, but here, it's this this idea right here that when you accuse people of dishonesty or of doing bad things of any kind, really blatantly like that, insincerity, it's a huge loss of face. And sometimes people like stick to the guns or start using even worse ways of trying to defend themselves other than to acknowledge that they made a mistake. If you play it aloof, you can help um, you can help them have an opportunity to play the game legit without a loss of face. They're like you're giving them another opportunity to get back on the truth seeking train in a way where they don't have to kind of do this um, humiliating thing or thing that they might be afraid of. So I think that's good advice. Um, to like if you want to recover the debate, if you want to make it productive, that this can be a nice invitation to do that. Of course, there are certain cases in which this doing this kind of um, giving this kind of really gracious space to someone, this kind of compassion may be inappropriate, especially for the most common case of rationalizing, which is when someone is rationalizing in order to avoid punishment, to avoid accountability. That's probably the most common setting in which I've seen rationalization show up is when someone's trying to deflect accountability and if you accuse them they're going to deflect even more so but you sometimes have to just do it because um, you can't just let someone off the hook if the case is serious enough but here's another reason uh, or here's another aspect of rationalization I want to talk about really quickly sometimes it's not something so nasty as the excuse to avoid punishment or accountability sometimes there are moments where arguing and rational debate is not the right thing to do um, and then chastising someone for not being rational in how they're approaching the situation might not be helpful. Um, so if sometimes when I am when I see someone rationalizing, I'm like, what else is going on? Why are they rationalizing? And then try to address that first. Um, and then maybe after that's addressed, we can go back to the space of critical truth seeking. But like we've talked about before, there's so many things that make critical truth seeking. Uh, anxiety provoking requires distress tolerance and sometimes people are not in the position to do it so have compassion for people in that be trying to figure out why are they rationalizing and what can you do to help support that person in dealing with that issue as I'm fond of saying sometimes people don't need arguments they need hugs so um, I think there's things that we can do to be charitable here in not just argumentative charity but uh, kindness and compassion um, for what each other are going through so um, you know, sometimes what is distracting us away from truth-seeking is uh, 
is worth prioritizing. And then other times, it's not. Like <laughs> trying to avoid someone selfishly um, or egoistically just trying to avoid accountability um, or punishment. That is, that's not legitimate. Um, okay, that's it for this time. Uh, we'll do some more fallacies in the next video, so I'll see you then.